Warriors Dennis here with you again. Today we're talking about agoraphobia. So if you have agoraphobia, if you know someone that's going through agoraphobia slash anxiety slash depression, this is the video for you and them. Now agoraphobia, what we're going to do is we're going to get to know agoraphobia a little better and then I'm going to give you guys the four steps that you need in order to overcome agoraphobia, not cope with it, not manage it, but overcome it, okay? First things first, what is agoraphobia? Agoraphobia is an intense fear of being in public places where you feel like escape will be difficult. Um, such places can be crowds, you know, a lot of crowds, uh, open spaces, um, public transport, for instance, uh, also being far from your home. For instance, me, I'm gonna talk about this later on, where I was stuck in my house for 31 days straight. 31 days straight. All I did was take steps outside of my house, but no, I didn't go to work, I didn't mingle with people, my relationships died out, no hobbies, no real goals, dreams, you know, it all stood still. So agoraphobia is diagnosed based on your symptoms and signs. And a lot of times it's diagnosed between the ages of 25 and 35. That's the most common, okay? Now, if you are currently taking benzodiazepines or SSRIs, this is my personal opinion, okay, that I'm gonna share with you. Benzodiazepines, okay, anti-anxiety medications are tranquilizers, okay? Now, very different than SSRIs, which in fact help your brain circuitry. What benzodiazepines do is they basically numb your symptoms, okay? So the symptom goes away, but the fear, the underlying fear, the root problem doesn't go away. A lot of times we talk about brain circuitry. And if we're gonna go SSRI or benzodiazepines, in my personal experience, SSRIs worked much better as far as restructuring my pairings in my brain. Pairings meaning the reason you have agoraphobia, which is I'm scared of public places. Well, public places in general, it, there's a pairing there. Public places will cause me anxiety or there's a certain person at work that I'm trying to avoid. Well, there's a pairing there. Certain person, anger, uh, makes you depressed, makes you confused, whatever it is, there are pairings there, okay? SSRIs do a better job of changing your brain circuitry. So you, when you begin implementing the four steps I'm gonna talk later on about, you start to find that, yes, you had one way of doing things, and then something else came in and, and there was a back and forth kind of tennis match going on, you know, stay in your house, don't stay in your house, you know, kind of thing. And you start to take some action. And then that became habitual, okay, it became habitual. And what is consciously focused on becomes a habit, becomes something that you no longer have to try to do. You know, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like a push when you begin implementing these things, okay? so. Like we talked about, crowds, open spaces, public places, and symptoms can be anything from chest pains, to racing hearts, to shortness of breath, um, to trembling, to choking, to dizziness. I know I had a lot of dizziness during my 31 days stuck in my home and suffering from agoraphobia, which in fact led me to deep, deep depression. 31 days started Okay, my 31 days at home started because people were criticizing me. People were criticizing me. And I found that when I got that criticism, even though there might have been some positivity there, something I could have taken, because of my upbringing, my upbringing said, you can never be criticized, you gotta be perfect at everything. So I, I, as a child growing up, I had this perfectionist type attitude that was laid upon me through my parents and my upbringing. So that carried on towards agoraphobia. As soon as I got uh, criticized or something didn't go my way, I said, I don't want to do that anymore. I avoided it. That's what we tend to do. Something pops up, we avoid it because no one taught us how to deal with fear or that we should deal with our fears. You know, the world preaches quick decisions and quick um, solutions. 
When there's no quick solutions, we tend to give up. We tend to say, well, you know what? I'm just gonna play the victim game. I'm good here, it's fine. Night Life isn't gonna get too hard, whatever it is. But that's no way of living. Let's understand that my progression with agoraphobia started, I didn't say I'm gonna be in my home forever. I never started like, I never started it like that. I just started to avoid one thing, then another thing. It was work, then it was, you know, social activities, then it was sports, then it was eating out, you know, and then it was relationships. There was just one after another, after another, after another. It was being grouped with each other. Next thing you know, I just said, you know what? I hate the world. I hate the way I see myself. I hate the way I see other people. I hate the way I see my future. And because I hate those things, I don't want to be a part of any of them. And yes, I had suicidal thoughts back in those days. So it was a very deep depression with agoraphobia. And I want to really pinpoint something that happened along the way, okay? With this agoraphobia struggle that I had, I remember being increasingly dehydrated at home, okay? Now, this is my own um, solution that I came up with. I was caffeine addict. I was a caffeine addict at home. I was drinking sodas. I was intaking large amounts of alcohol, you know, with depression, it, there all sorts of things come up, right? And these things are full of high fructose corn syrup, also toxic artificial sweeteners. These things create dehydration, okay? Dehydration is a big reason for those headaches or those certain symptoms that you experience. Most of North America, and in fact the world, is dehydrated. Do not wait until you're in fact thirsty to begin to drink something, okay? That's in fact going to replace that and help you with the dehydration and feed you some electrolytes or whatever it may be. So what I did for my agor agoraphobia that then led to depression was I started to implement unprocessed sea salt into my diet every day and mountain spring water, a combination of those things. Not uh, table salt, but unprocessed sea salt, Himalayan salt, and, and just small amounts, right, with my water. So I began becoming conscious of those things. Next thing you know, my depression subsided. When my depression subsided, I started to gain a history of success. Wow, maybe I can do those things. Maybe I can confront those things that I'm so scared of. So it started there. Then came the four steps, okay? The four steps was first and foremost, I, I'm a big fan of flooding, where in CBT and NLP, we talk about flooding as far as putting yourself in a situation and then changing the meaning of the thing that you fear, the stimuli. I'm big on that, I am. But in my case, after 31 days, you could imagine the fear. You could imagine the buildup. You could imagine that if I was to go and just jump in, my mind was going to say, what the, what the heck are you doing? Don't do, don't do that. Get back in the house. Get back in the house. Right? So because of that feeling, I said, I've got to take a step-by-step -step, um, routine here to overcome this. So I had to start with my mindset, which is step number one. I had to get the drive to do this. I had to get the drive. So I attached tons of pain, and this is going through NLP again, Neuro Linguistic Programming. I attached lots of pain to staying in my house for the next six months, year, two years. What was I gonna miss out on? I was gonna miss out on playing with my son outside. I was gonna miss out on the weddings I wanted to go to. I was gonna miss out on the relationships that I wanted to build. There was lots and lots of pain attached to staying in that stale position. Then I attached tons of pleasure to what might happen when, not if, when I in fact overcame my agoraphobia. So pleasure, you know what? Oh my God, I'm gonna build that business. I'm gonna go out and start networking. Oh, that would be so nice. And then 
oh, I've always wanted to go to Rome, I've always wanted to go to Milan and this and that and Germany and Europe tra travels. I needed to attach myself to the pleasures that overcoming agoraphobia was going to give me. Really important. So that was step one. Get the mindset engaged in the right way. Stop playing the victim. Stop playing, you know, feeling sorry for yourself. It took me 31 days to overcome this, but you know, when I work with someone one-on-one, -on -one, personally or through the program, I guide them in a way where it's a lot faster. The progression is quicker. So that was step one. Get in the right mindset. Okay. Step two. Begin implementing relaxation exercises. Now, we talk about relaxation in the outside world a lot. You know, there's a lot of professionals out there as far as meditation goes, as far as guided visualization goes, as far as progressive muscle relaxation. These are all things, tools that can be used to bring yourself to neutral, to a neutral state. When you're in a calm, neutral state, then what happens is your amygdala, the part of your mind that responds to uh, a certain stimuli in a way where it's ready to fight, flight, or freeze, doesn't get as active. Okay, so when you start to implement relaxation techniques into your four step process, after you've gained the mindset, the amygdala starts to slowly turn off. No longer are those things you look at so fearful and scary going in the outside world, talking with people, I'm going back to work, traveling. It's not bad now. It's not bad, which gives me a light, gives me a window to implement step number three, which is the most important part, systematically desensitizing yourself. So what I did was I created a ladder, a hierarchy. I said, if I can't flood myself with the things I fear and put myself out there after 31 days of suffering, I've got to systematically do this. So first things first, you know, I started with the things that were a one to two level anxiety for me. And then I went to the three and then the five and then the seven and the nine and the 10. And as I went up that ladder, the 10 looked like I could do it. I could do it. When I got to three, five was within reach. When I got to five, seven didn't look as intimidating. When I got to seven, nine didn't, and then 10 and I crushed it just like you're going to crush it. So I started watching YouTube videos step, you know, stage one in my hierarchy, in my ladder, you know, watching YouTube videos of people who overcame agoraphobia, you know, I watched, um, house hunters, but well, it's a funny show. I love that show, but house hunters, uh, international where they're buying a house, they're going in and out of a house. So just looking, you know, whatever I was looking at on the TV, I was in fact in experiencing in my mind right? You tend to get caught up in what you're watching. Okay. So I was like, okay, well, they're going in the house and out the house and they're doing things. I start to watch videos, right? Then I started to draw. I started to draw myself walking out of the house. I started to imagine myself walking out of the house. I started to imagine myself mingling with people, building my relationships. I started to see myself traveling the world and what you see in your mind is a reflection of what's happening in the outside world. So if you can picture something in your mind, your mind goes, oh, that's actually happening, right? We talk about visualization big time, big time in the podcast. So what your mind imagines, you are actually doing. When you imagine on a daily basis that you're getting out of your house and doing these things that deep down you wanna do, you are living that. You are living it out. Just like I tell so many people, if there's something that you went through back in the day and you want to reframe it and you want to see it in a different light and you want to gain the lesson from what happened and you want to change the way your perspective is on that thing, guess what? You imagine it here, it becomes real. You've experienced it. Fantastic. Some people need one to five repetitions as far as visualization goes. Some people need 20. But the main thing is, is that you are taking the steps necessary to prove to your protective mind that you no longer have to protect me so much. I don't need protection so much. I don't need it. 
and watch why I don't need it. And you start surrounding yourself with the evidence on why your mind, your amygdala doesn't have to protect you so much. I don't need these symptoms all the time. I don't need to be flustered because now I have a sense of self-control, right? So the systematic desensitization is where you make your ladder step by step by step by step by step till you get to number 10. But it's not all about making the ladder. It's about implementing it as well. So now you find out and you say, well, step number one is going to take me all day. I'm going to just focus on step one today. Great. Awesome. Then step two tomorrow, then step three the next day. Some people are like, well, I finished step one on my hierarchy. I'm going to go to step two right away. Yeah, it's not as fearful as it was, right? I like this idea of progressing. Then you could do step three and step four on the same day. Some people are more sensitized than others, and that's fine. Once you have done your systematic desensitization hierarchy and you've implemented it on a daily basis, you've gotten to where you want to get to. You're there. You've left your house. You are now in crowds. You are now in open spaces. You are now far from your house and you're neutral. You're neutral, right? You're not feeling like, oh, I don't know what to do in this situation. Oh God, I'm so not feeling. And you're not like, hey, yay, I'm, it's fantastic. But you're neutral. You're like, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good here. And that's a great place to be. Neutral is a great place to be. Vanilla. When you start to get bored of those things that you start, you, you used to fear so much. That's a great place to be. Once you've done step three, you've got to get to step four. Step four is to remind yourself of why you must continue to challenge yourself on a daily basis. What's your why? What's your why? Everybody needs a why. Every day when you wake up in the morning, why? Because of my kids. Why? Because I want to further myself. A lot of times people have other, others goals where your main drive is based around what you're going to do for other people. And then a lot of people have internal goals where they say, I'm doing this because I want to progress in this manner, because I want to get that raise, because I want to build my relationship, because I want to travel the world, whatever it is. So you have to be surrounded by your why as you start to implement your, your systematic desensitization hierarchy ladder and be reminded of it on a daily basis, okay? Do not do what works and you feel good and there you are outside world, you've overcome agoraphobia, you've overcome depression and then you stop doing all the things that got you there. No, it's not about that. Self-development is a constant, never-ending journey. Continue to do the things that got you there. Continue to be reminded of the fundamentals, the fundamentals which are based around exercise, diet, relationships, and sleep. These are just a couple of the fundamentals that you continuously need to build in your life to be in touch with one of the human needs, which is growth and significance and love and connection, okay? These are things that you need, I need on a daily basis, and we meet those in a positive or negative way on a daily basis. We might as well meet them positively. So fall in love with progress. You, my friends, you are more than anxiety. I love you so very much. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to like this video. Make sure to share it with somebody that's struggling. Guys, inspire somebody with a share today, and I'll see you in the next video.